Good evening, everyone. Welcome to our evening talk. having a conversation about law. There's a certain law that people were talking about and it got me thinking about the concept of rules. Rules is an interesting concept. Do we need rules? How important are rules? Should we have lots of rules or only few rules? Where do we draw the line? What does it mean to set a rule? So in Buddhism we have this concept of sila. Sila which means your It means a person's behavior or deportment or way. It means normal. Yes, that's what it means. It means normal. But what it means, why we what it means, why we use it to refer to ethics or morality, is because sila refers to what is normal for a certain individual. For some people, it's normal for them to do bad things. So they're called dusila, someone with a normal behavior that's not very good. Someone is sutsila or silawa, if they've got good ethics, if their normal behavior is is ethical and good. But when we talk about Sila, we often talk about rules. And what the relationship is, is that rules are like fence posts, right? Talked about this before. If you see a cow outside of the fence, how you know it's in the wrong place is because of the fence posts. If it's outside of the boundaries, you say, oh, the cow got out, or the horse got out. So if a person acts outside of a certain set of rules, this is how we define easily, sort of, in a, a, a simple, simplistic sort of way, we define morality based on rules because we know, well, this person has transgressed the boundaries of what is ethical. How we know that is because there's this rule and they stepped outside of it. They crossed that line. Rules make that easy. Now, rules, of course, are problematic in terms of describing ethics and morality well, but or in detail, but it's, imp it's important that we respect the utility of rules. I mean, we often complain about Western meditators or even modern meditators of any it's not even a Western thing anymore It's even in Buddhist countries there are meditators who have sort of abandoned any concept of, of morality or ethics in, in, 
in relation to meditation practice. So I have a friend here who wanted me to teach her how to meditate, and I knew she was a regular user of, of cannabis. And uh, I said, well, you have to stop taking psychoactive drugs first. Which, of course, doesn't go over with, well with, with, with a great portion of the spiritual world these days. And it's not that I have anything against marijuana. I think it's a fairly benign form of of whatever uh, mental alteration. It doesn't do much. It never did much for me. But it does something, and it 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 has this eff effect of not only altering the mind, but becoming a crutch by which you avoid ordinary reality, by which you dampen the 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 harshness of reality. So you, how can you deal with reality in its unadulterated, pure form? If you're consciously avoiding it anyway Point being There's not this sense that Morals and ethics are are important And it's dangerous Because It's, it's perfectly possible to Be an ethical and moral person without any rules But it's so much easier to transgress the 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 line of between ethics and and uh, immorality without the without the fence without the the fence posts without the rules oh, what was what was interesting about this conversation I was having was was about Enforcing rules When you set up rules You force people into a certain behavior, right? O under threat of something And I think that's where it gets problematic Is when you start to threaten punishment Not that punishment is necessarily always wrong I, I think perhaps it's not in certain forms at least in terms of uh, rehabilitation and um, convincing the community of your sincerity to reform. But if rules are all about causing pain to someone who does something wrong, then of course they can become quite unwholesome themselves. And the rules end up being the problem. This is what happens in fascist societies, fascist dictatorships and so on. Where you have lots of rules that end up being for purposes, for nefarious purposes, rather than for the purposes of good. But I want us to warm up to rules in general, the concept of rules. It's one of these concepts, like as I was talking about religiosity or religion. I'd like a people to, I think it'd be good if we warm up to the concept of religious behavior in terms of taking things seriously. And I think it's also useful if we warm up to the idea of rules. Precepts, I mean. You see, these are, these are things that about religion, right, about Let's say Buddhism Religiosity, rules These are the things that irk Newcomers the most, I think The idea of being forced to follow rules is uncomfortable Because we've been forced to follow rules that we didn't understand And we've, we, we often tend to cultivate the the idea that rules are are a means of control, right? A means of of power, power play, and egoism, and 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 so on, by by people who want who crave power, right? I 
And of course rules are used in that way, but rules are not always... I mean, it's not the purpose of rules. The purpose of rules is to control, but it's to control the community in the sense of... not exactly control, I suppose, but it's to have some sort of control over who is considered to be a part of the community and who is not. So you ostracize those who are acting counter to the goals and uh, direction of the community. And the meditation community is, is should be the same, right? If someone started acting in a way that was disturbing other meditators, we would have to probably just kick them out and say, sorry, you broke the rules. Rules are also useful in that way to uh, to have something to, to point to. Hey, we have this rule and you broke it. Because otherwise you say, you're just behaving, you're behaving poorly. It doesn't have the same power to it, right? Not that we're looking to kick people out, or not that we ever really have that I can remember. But it's good to have guidelines and rules. Take the eight precepts. If someone breaks the eight precepts, I once had a meditator, it was quite funny, he, he came to me uh, for reporting and he was kind of uh, was sad or feeling guilty and he said uh, he did something that, uh, he did something wrong and uh, he said, what is it? And he says, oh, uh, he says, uh, I just couldn't handle the lust and last night I masturbated. This has only happened to me once. I've never, it's the only time someone's ever actually done that in a meditation course. But he couldn't handle it. And uh, I said, oh, well, okay, well, you'll have to retake the eight precepts then because that's the tradition. The tradition would be if you break them. And he was shocked. He said, it's against the eight precepts. <laughs> he hadn't even realized So clear understanding of the eight precepts is a good one. Ajahn Tong told me this, told us this story once. Um, well, he just mentioned really that when he was in Burma, he went to a small meditation center and he asked them, "What are the rules of the center?" Right? You know, meditation center in Bangkok would have had lots of rules. What are the rules of your center? And the monks looked at him and said, "What?" Well, we have the eight precepts. I mean, isn't that enough? And that struck him, and it struck me when he said that as, as, as somehow important, you know, not to that that there's something elegant at any rate of having few rules, but having a clear set of of rules. To be clear that uh, the important rules are the eight precepts. At our center here, we don't have that many extra rules. We have rules about not keeping leftovers in the kitchen, in the in the in the refrigerator, because they will go bad, and someone might eat poisonous food. Uh, we have rules about recycling. We have rules about we, have, we don't have so many rules. We have a few rules and guidelines. Look after the place because we don't have a cleaning lady or or man. No janitors here. But it's important to understand that rules aren't aren't all morale all uh, that we we mean by sila. In fact, I think what most of us have a, have some sense of. We have some sense of the fact that true morality has nothing to do with rules. True morality is a part of the practice. And so there's sometimes this, for, for newcomers anyway, there might be this suspicion of the rules for that reason, because we understand that it's all about what's going on in the mind, and so we think, well, who needs rules, right? And we're suspicious when we hear about all these rules, the eight precepts, we think these are people who are adhering to rites and rituals and clinging to dogmas, right? 
And so it's important to clear clear that up and to clarify that no, these aren't dogmas, these are signposts, and they're also things we can point to. We can point back at the signpost and say, look, you went the wrong way. See, there's a signpost. That's what rules are for. But morality is much more than that. It is the rules. It is keeping the rules and keeping within the fence that makes up is made up by the fence post to stay within the realm of good morality using the five and the eight precepts as our guide a guide but not a um, by no means a exhaustive list of things you might do wrong torture isn't on that list for example even in the eight precepts there's nothing about harsh speech or divisive speech not about gossiping chatting none of that's on there and yet those would be considered to be problematic for meditators and so the Visuddhimagga breaks this down into four types of morality I'm not sure where it comes from whether it's can't remember if it's somewhere else, but at least it's in the Visuddhi Magga. Does a good job of explaining the four types of morality. There's the first is the rules. The second is reflecting on our usage, reflecting on our our possessions. Reflecting on the objects with which we interact Let's put it that way Reflecting Morality through reflecting and So this refers to our, our everyday life When we eat uh, When we sleep When we put on our clothes to reflect And to be mindful of our daily lives Our daily activities of course, this is accomplished through meditation practice. When a person is mindful, there's not much danger of, of indulging in excess. But it's still a good guideline for meditators. It's certainly a good guideline for people living in the world, for you who have to deal with houses and possessions and cars and all the accoutrements of lay life to consider the use and to be careful in our use of things so we don't go to excess so that we don't eat in excess so that we eat to live, not live to eat and we don't become obsessed with good tastes and even get sick out of our gluttony that we don't engage in frivolous activities like wearing lots of makeup or jewelry or Fancy clothes, trying to look good, styling our hair. Trimming our beards and so on. Trying to look nice. Worrying about our weight. Becoming obsessed with, with medicines, other things that we use. Drugs. Being very careful with what we use. And by extension, everything else, our cars, our, our electronic devices. But ultimately, especially for the meditators here in the center, it means being mindful. When you eat, eating should be a meditation. It should be chewing, chewing, swallowing. Even when you raise the food to your mouth, raising, placing... When you shower, showering should be a meditation, scrubbing, scrubbing. When you brush your teeth, brushing, brushing. When you sleep at night, sleeping should be a lying meditation. You shouldn't just try to go to sleep, you should lie down and try to stay awake, try to meditate. Try to be as mindful as you can as you fall asleep, aware of the rising and the falling. Or even just that you're lying, lying. 
then of course you accomplish this one without much trouble. The third is our livelihood. So this is not really applicable to meditators here in the center. Your livelihood is to come up to the kitchen and to uh, defrost some pizza. That's the extent of your livelihood these days. For those of you in the world, this would mean having ethical livelihood. You know, not cheating other people or not being greedy or wanting to make lots of money and be rich. Not obsessing over that kind of thing. Not engaging in wrong types of livelihood that involve killing, stealing, lying, cheating, or even just dealing with things that are problematic like selling weapons or poisons or human beings or even animals and the fourth one really the most important and it applies to everyone here for all of us who are in interested in the meditation practice is called Indriya Sangvara Siddha Guarding the senses Cultivating a state of a normal state Cultivating restraint of the senses Or guard, a guarding of the senses as a normal state of being When we see something, let it only be seeing When we hear, let it only be hearing When we smell, let it only be smelling even in terms of what we look at or what we allow ourselves to engage in. Sometimes you want to avoid delicious food because you know that it's difficult to be mindful when you have delicious food and you end up just devouring it and you re don't realize where it's gone. So you want to have plain and ordinary food because it makes you more mindful. Certainly sometimes when you're walking around you want to avoid looking here and there so that you get caught up and lose your tra the track of your mindfulness lose the moment very easy with the eyes to get caught up and to get lost and to lose track of where you are and what you're doing so guarding even in the sense of avoiding certain certain uh, sensations see certain sights or sounds or smells or so but on an ultimate level, this refers to the meditation. It means when you see, you just remind yourself seeing, seeing. When you hear, you remind yourself hearing, hearing. It may seem like something quite simple and, and superficial even. This isn't deep teaching, right? Seeing is just seeing. What's so special about that? The truth is seeing... When you when you perceive seeing as just seeing, that can lead you to enlightenment. That which you see is impermanent; it arises and ceases. Its suffering means it, it can't possibly be a source of happiness for you, and anything you see that you cling to will only cause you stress and disappointment because it's it can't satisfy. It. It's not capable of bringing you true happiness. Non-self, you can't control it, you can't hold on to it, you can't keep it the way it is or keep it from coming. So when you say to yourself, seeing, seeing, even just that, the shift that that brings about in your awareness, how that suddenly makes you aware of this moment, that alone can lead to true and irrevocable enlightenment you know, the true change of lineage it leads one to become a sotapanna, sakitagami, anagami even an arahant there are even cases of people who became pacheka buddhas just by looking at something and by seeing impermanence in their experience one person became a pacheka buddha by watching a leaf fall from the tree and it just struck them so so profoundly that they suddenly became mindful and were able to see impermanent suffering and non-self and become a Buddha, a Pacheka Buddha anyway.
In fact, to some extent, this is an important thing, the simplicity of the practice. Because a huge part of the problem is something we call papancha, which is complicating things, extrapolating and making more of things than they actually are. So by, by design, the practice is simple. It's meant to return you again and again to the simple, ordinary nature of reality. By design, that's what it's for. Anyway, so there you go. That's the Dhamma for tonight. Hope you all are able to cultivate sila. And may we all cultivate Arya sila or Arya kanta sila. And the sila, the normal behavior that is delightful to the enlightened ones. Okay. If there are any questions, I'll answer them. Actually, going to look on the web here. I'm wondering if we have some questions on the web. Oh, we have two questions on the website. I've been having difficulties in meditation. Even when reading or taking part in conversation, certain sounds distract me very easily. Misophonia, I think it's called. Sadly, I can't find a consistently quiet place to meditate. When meditating in the presence of noise, I must note listening almost constantly. And even when it's quiet, there is an unpleasant sense of anticipation. Is there some way I can alter the practice to make this more bearable, or what do you recommend? Well, I'd prefer hearing than listening, because hearing refers to the experience, listening refers to the action, which is not really an action we want to engage in per se, it's semantics, but hearing's probably better. Um, but that's not a problem, and this is quite apropos of tonight's talk. Um... The unpleasant sense of anticipation is also important. I mean, anticipation comes from the fact that sound is impermanent. You know, it's impermanent suffering and non-self. I mean, that's what you're seeing. And that's an important part of the practice. I mean, this is really a, an opportunity ripe for you to realize, you know, gain deep realization, at least of your your own neuroses or you know your own problems so the the deep sense of anticipation or anxiety or, or fear or so on should be noted and then the sound should be noted it's fine i mean this will not last it's not something that's going to stay with you forever and even if it did it would be a perfectly valid object of meditation so whatever you feel about the sound if you're frustrated or anxious or worried or or so on should be noted, anxious, anxious, when you get frustrated, frustrated, frustrated. When you're just hearing the sounds, it would just be hearing, hearing. And you would try, would prefer you to try to come back to the stomach, but it's fine. If then you right away go back to the sound, then note hearing, hearing. It's perfectly valid, and it takes patience, and it builds patience, and that's important. As you do this, your patience will increase, and your objectivity will increase and sound will become less and less of a thing to be feared. But it's a habit, you know, this is a habit you've obviously developed. It's going to take time to rework that habit. So just be patient and understand that meditation is a process. It's not a pill that you can take as a quick fix. I meditate regu here regularly and I've learned a lot through your teachings. I was hoping to go to a meditation center near my home and it's connected to the Dhammakaya Foundation. Have you heard of it? Tell me the tradition is similar to what you practice here. Now the Dhammakaya is quite different. It's considered by many to be a cult. I tend to think I'm one of those people. 
the Dhammakaya cult has some really weird ideas and practices and they've done a lot of good in a superficial way but they've done a lot of bad in terms of perverting the orthodox teachings of Buddhism so I would not recommend that, not in the least Here's something, I'm, I do mean to, uh, I have meant to do a video, and I, I'll try to do one this weekend. So, um, I'm going to Florida next this month to hopefully do some teaching, to visit my mother, to visit my friends there, and also to um, take part in a... An, a an act of wholesomeness. So Robin, I think, is Robin here tonight? That looks like Robin. Is that Robin sitting in the back row? Yeah. It's funny how you look like Robin. It's quite impressive, actually. From behind, anyway. Um, so yeah, we are... We, we Robin has graciously set up for the second year in a row a online campaign to raise money for the children's home in Tampa Bay, Florida. Now the whole the deal here is we're not um you know we're not suddenly becoming uh, uh um sort of we're not becoming becoming obsessed with charity work or we're not going to get too involved with charity work but the idea is because it's the gift-giving season and there's a general general sort of question, I suppose, of, of how to or what sorts of gifts to give that are of greatest benefit. And there's often even a question of ways of making gift-giving more meaningful than simply giving things to people that they'll, they really don't need, right? Especially when there are people in need. So charity often comes up, and so the idea here was for myself and for my family um, and for all of you and your families that to provide an alternative option of gift giving and, and one that would be sort of uh, impactful because we did it all together. So this is a home that um, takes care of kids who have troubles, who have maybe run away from home. It's you know, there was no real, there was no specific reason why we chose this one. It just happens to be one that uh, we're familiar with, or or people we know are familiar with, and seems like a wholesome, non-biased or specific sort of charity. And uh, so we're all, you know, we have this opportunity to get together and give or do our gift giving in this way on behalf of people we love or just in lieu of gift giving so my mom has been talking about you know, they were talking about doing this in the past with her husband and his family and so they're hopefully going to get involved if they haven't already uh, and instead of giving gifts we'll you know, take this money and do some goodness with it do some good deeds with it it's uh, just a thing so Robin I think just posted a link in the chat if anybody wants to take part in that please feel welcome I mean again it's it's not something I want to pressure you into by any means I'm not soliciting money here but uh, just announcing this collective act of goodness so there you go and with that there were no other questions, I guess. I think. Alright, then I'm going to say goodnight and wish you all a good practice.